all things of dust to dust return on earth and in the sky. The hottest, brightest suns that burn in time grow dim and die. The fish that leap, the birds that soar, the newborn young that play. The leaves that fill the forest floor revert to dust and clay. Good morning, friends. Welcome to our online worship service for Sunday, March 19th. This is now the fourth Sunday in Lent. Baptism is sometimes called enlightenment. The gospel for this Sunday is the story of a man born blind who was healed by Christ. I was blind, now I see, declares the man. In baptism, God opens our eyes to see the truth of who we are, God's beloved children. As David was anointed king of Israel, just so in baptism, God anoints our head with oil and calls us to bear witness to the light of Christ in our daily lives. As we gather for this worship service, whether in person or online, we lift our praises to God, offer our concerns, hear the word, and recognize God's presence with us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And thus we go out inspired and empowered to bring God's light to others. Our worship begins this morning as we confess our sins, and receive the assurance of God's abundant forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt, though you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Hear the good news. For God so loved the world that God gave the only Son, so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power. Amen. The grace of Christ Jesus, our Savior, the reconciling love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join me at this time in the prayer of the day. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your Spirit. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading assigned for this fourth Sunday of Lent is from the 
first book of Samuel. We're going to read from the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm assigned for this Sunday is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here ends our reading from the Psalms. The second reading assigned for this morning is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We'll read from the fifth chapter, verses 8 to 14. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Sleeper, awake. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, we prepare our hearts for the gospel.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him. And the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. 
Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In John's Gospel, Jesus is constantly revealing his identity to us. Sometimes it comes through his words, like when he came straight out and told that woman at the well that he is the Messiah. And sometimes it comes through signs that prove that God had blessed him with a, a unique power to do the works of God. In John's Gospel, Jesus came to be a sign for us, to be the light in our darkness. Jesus comes not to condemn the world, but to save it. And he does this by bringing his light into the darkness of our world and thus showing us the truth of our world and the reality of our own nature and the reality of God's nature. For John, the fact that we are people who, who sometimes do hurtful things is bad, but it's not the worst thing. The worst thing is to deceive ourselves about our nature in the nature of Christ, and therefore to continue living in the dark. Our gospel story today is being told on at least two levels. On a literal level, Jesus is relating to a person who had been born blind, and Jesus heals him, and you'd think that everyone would be just ecstatic about that amazing thing that had just happened. But instead, what the restoration of his sight does is to highlight the spiritual blindness of the others. You see, it's not just this man who had been blind. In our story, the disciples were also blind when they asked Jesus whose sins had caused this man to have been born blind. Actually, they were voicing both sides of a debate that is, well, honestly, still being hashed out today. On the one side, we have those who follow the teachings that we find in Exodus and Deuteronomy. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generations of those who reject me. So, according to this tradition, it would seem to be just a no-brainer that this man's parents or their parents or grandparents must have sinned and God was taking it out on the child by dooming him to be born blind. But later, the prophet Ezekiel hears God emphatically denying this, and God declares, A child shall not suffer for the iniquity of a parent, nor a parent suffer for the iniquity of a child. The righteousness of the righteous shall be his own, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be his own. So the disciples, they're pretty much just raising up the only two options that they can imagine. Either... This man was born blind because one of his ancestors had sinned, or he himself must have done something just pretty dreadful while he was still in the womb in order to cause God to punish him in this way, with this blindness. But Jesus says, you know what? It's none of the above. The disciples, they were in fact absolutely blind to God's real nature, for our God is not that kind of a God at all. The truth is that those who imagine that our God is like some pagan God sitting on Mount Olympus and casting lightning bolts at the sinners, they're blind to the real nature of God. So what Jesus reveals is that our God is a God of grace and not a God of vengeance. And then come the Pharisees, and they are blind because even when the truth is staring them in the face, they allow their pride, their learning, their status, and their pre-existing beliefs to close their eyes to the truth. 
The Pharisees, they questioned whether the man who had received his sight was really the same man that had once been blind. They discount his testimony to what had happened. And they labeled Jesus a sinner because he has broken one of the 39 rules of what they think ought not to be done on the Sabbath by, by kneading that mud. And what they should have been doing instead was rejoicing that on this Sabbath, God had chosen to heal this man. Really, I suppose the Pharisees were blind because they preferred to live in the comfort of their own darkness rather than to allow the light to enter and disrupt their traditions and assumptions. And I have to say that this form of blindness is very much in evidence in our world today. We live in a world where so many of us are so committed to our own version of the truth that we're not open to any light that might shine into our darkness. It's like the myth of our own rightness is more important to us than the truth itself. And that just ought not to be the way of things. But so long as we're locked in our darkness and refuse to open our eyes to the light, we're choosing darkness over the light. And according to John, living in the darkness is not so much a shame in itself, it's preferring to remain in the darkness once the light has come near. All through this story, this man who was once blind is the pattern for those who long to see. He tells the simple truth, even if there may be consequences. He's willing to say, you know, I don't have all the answers, but this bit I know. And then he shares his truth. And his mind and heart, they're open to the truth. When he's in the presence of the truth that he can now, through the grace of God, both hear and see, his response is to fall down and worship the Lord. You see, there's no disgrace in being physically blind. Blindness doesn't suggest that this person is of lesser value or, as that movie once implied, children of a lesser God. Physical blindness, like any other condition beyond our control is not God's punishment. It's simply the facts that become the setting for our lives as we wait upon the Lord to reveal God's goodness and glory through our own circumstances. But on the other hand, the kind of spiritual blindness that we find in this story is something we may well be bringing upon ourselves and, and clinging to. And the shame of this is simply that while we choose to live in the darkness, we are missing the joy of living in the light. Near the end of our reading, Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. And I don't think that this implies that Jesus will strike those who pretend that they can see spiritually with any kind of blindness at all. I think that would be going back to that dark image of a, a vengeful God that Jesus has shown up as untrue. Instead, this is Jesus telling us the obvious. Wherever he goes, his light reveals all that exists in the darkness and prefers the darkness. That's his nature. And the judgment that he is, is revealed in the way some are drawn to his light, while others flee from it and choose to remain in their darkness. In fact, the Pharisees seem to be about the business of spreading their own darkness in order to shade his light. It's like they're trying to explain away his acts of power and undermine his claim to be the one sent by God. They're offering alternative scenarios in order to maintain their own pride and power, and they're muddying the waters to keep others from seeing clearly as well. In our times, as in the times of Christ, the truth is so very important, but those who have decided that their own egos and images are the most important thing are busy casting dust in the eyes of others in order to keep the light from shining too brightly upon them. 
Friends, those of us who have been called by Christ to reflect his light must be so firmly centered upon him that we are willing to lay down every false hope, every proud facade, every tenuous explanation that exalts us and deflects the light of the truth. What matters is not the cult of us, but only the light that Christ Jesus brought into this darkness. And if we are more comfortable living in the darkness, then we truly ought to just name that and own it. At least then we will no longer be blind to that truth. But if the light of Christ means anything to us, then we should walk into that light, fully expecting that not every revelation we find there will be easy or pleasing for us, but knowing that our God in Christ Jesus is ready to forgive, ready to heal, and ready to lead us from light into light, that we might go out as reflections of his light for the sake of his world and to the glory of his name. Amen. Please join me now as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Eternal God, you seal us by the Holy Spirit and mark us with the cross of Christ forever in baptism. Inspire us by your love as together we strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Creating God, by your word you have made all things, and you hate nothing you have made. Teach us to perceive the beauty of the breadth of your creation, from the grandest mountain range to the smallest springtime bud. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Powerful God, you anoint kings and establish rulers. Guide the work of heads of state and elected officials. Encourage them to lead with justice 
and to remove barriers that impede the well-being of all. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Shepherding God, you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Keep watch over those who weep. Tend all who are sick and comfort those who grieve. This morning we especially lift to you Ron, Blake, Mary, Jeanette, Jerry, Marianne, Mike, Ray, Myrtle, Cecilia, Phyllis, Kim, Cheryl, Bishop Satterley, Ron, Kim, John, Inez, Jacob, Pamela, Grace, Denny, Fatima, Brody, and Jim. Along with these, we lift you all those living or working at the Samaritas Lodge, woods, or terraces. And we lift to you, asking for your consolation, the family and friends of Marie Morrison. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, our host, you fill us at your table with more than we could ever ask. Feed us with hunger for justice. Equip the feeding ministries of NECOM and this congregation and our entire community. Nourish us so we can nourish our neighbors. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of history, with thanksgiving we remember our ancestors in the faith who cared for your people. We praise you for the ways they formed the faith of others and continue to inspire us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Please join me now in our offertory prayer. God of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of the gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus our Lord, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Embodied God, in your word and presence, we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen.
And now we receive the blessing. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Go in peace, serve in love. Thanks be to God. Lord, mark with dust and ash my brow, so I may comprehend that every moment here and now links me to that same end. I share with all that breathe and burn, that flare and fade and tire. Yet by their waning light discern your own undying fire. Lord, mark upon my brow the sign, a stark and barren cross, reminding me that though divine, you know my pain and loss. And at the touch of dust and ash, awake my heart to view how death itself is but a flash that dies away in you. 